Uh, Raymond and Pale Limited is the company that he's attached with. He is actually the managing director of that company. Is the largest and longest established practice of chartered valuation surveyors and property consultants in Trinidad and Tobago, having opened in 1972. Mr. Raymond, Afro Raymond, I'm talking about, is the managing director. He holds a BS and C in land administration and a and valuation from the University of East London and qualified as a chartered surveyor in 1993. It is good to have you here this morning, sir. Thank you so much. Good morning, Rennie. Good morning to our listeners, and it's a pleasure to be here. Love the spirit of the, I have of to the put, shot, yes. I have to put the headphones on so I can hear myself, uh, and perhaps more of our people should do that. <laughs> yes, uh, because this is going to be a very interesting conversation. Yes. Afro, you have been an advocate. You have been fighting. You have won uh, the, the right to see some papers. You would never got the chance to see them. Had you seen them, maybe we would have known about that $10 billion. I want to get to that a little bit. Mm -hmm. I want to start talking about No Man's Land. The spokesperson for CL Financial Shareholders, <clears throat> as, as spokespersons, according to the finance minister, are wrong, he said, in stating that the government, and by extension the people of Trinidad and Tobago, purchased uh, the Tobago assets of CL uh, Financials at below market price. Mm -hmm. You are a surveyor. Mm -hmm. Thus, more than anybody else qualified to appraise and give an informed opinion yeah. on what is at stake here. Was the property, no man's land in Tobago, in fact, undervalued and sold to the people of Trinidad and Tobago, transferred? Well, that, that's a really important question because all of the talk about no man's land and the transfer of the property reminded me of nothing so much as the noise about Eden Gardens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so in the Eden Gardens situation, you had a particular group of people who were trying to perpetrate, and I'll say it again on the air, complex fraud. I hope you all are listening. You were trying to perpetrate a complex fraud on the taxpayer. Mm. And therefore, you held on to a particular end of the discussion and tried to persuade the public. And in fact, you ultimately did a transaction that the property was sold at a five times overvalue. <laughs> and ironically enough, you know, it's interesting. There's an echo, there's a synchronicity, there's a meaning to things. Ironically enough, in the no man's land, we also have a five times overvalue, a kind of an echo like an echo chamber from the long-time DJs. So it's ironic <laughs> that I'm here with Rennie B this morning. Because, because the actual value, from what I read in the press, I've not seen any real documents. From what mm. I read in the press, the value at which the property was transferred was $174 million TT dollars. Right. This is um, the Golden Grove property down at, um, which is colloquially known as No Man's Land. Mm -hmm. The district is No Man's Land. It's how it's collo called colloquially. That property was transferred for a figure about 174 million and Mr. Imbert when he spoke on Thursday that was the 3rd of August Mr. Imbert spent a certain amount of time explaining in, in relation to the valuation explaining the two valuations he had, had done mm -hmm. um, the, the central bank had, had done one was um, the the valuation by Farrell which is a rival to Raymond and Pierre and then there was another valuation by a foreign firm I think I think it was a British based Duffin Phelps yes which is an international firm and uh, I have to say, I haven't, I haven't seen, I've seen one of those valuations, and I don't want to comment on the valuation. Let's just comment on the figures and to say that if I did a valuation today of that property, and I know the property very well mm -hmm. because I've done it, I did it 21 years ago. If I did a valuation on that property today, it wouldn't be more than $200 million. So I don't accept that there's a problem of the type that is being alleged. I, I'm also bemused, as I said, in, in relation to the five times ratio. I'm also bemused by the fact that the, the project rebirth report or proposal, which we haven't seen, it's been mentioned by various parties when they want to prove mm. this point or that point, that the project rebirth report produced by Pricewaterhouse cites a value for the property of 867 million, mm. which is almost exactly, mm. it's like one of those marvelous coincidences, five times more than 174. So, this five times thing, I think the onus is really on the other side now, if I may. I hope you all are listening, Mr. Permel and Mr. Carter and Reese and so on. Give us a copy of the valuation, the one that, mm. that, that, that proves five the property is worth $867 mm -hmm. million Because mm -hmm. I, I could say to you, there are no comparables that support that. So I can extract from what you're There's saying. There's no evidence that, that supports that. That's convenient for you and, and okay. 
you, Surveyor, your yeah. company, the two companies, uh, Surveyors, uh, mm-hmm. mentioned by the Minister of Finance, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, this information would not have been lost on these folks. You were seeing some other reason for this um, overvalue, over, 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 undervalue um, claim. Well, yeah. I mean, the, the claim actually has two limbs. Huh? Let, 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 us be, let us be fair for, for a minute here. The first limb is that there's a degree of self-dealing. So one of the claims that's being made is that the government sits on both sides of the transaction. Mm. The government sits on one side of the transaction because effectively the state has control of CL Financial and the Minister of Finance can mm. legally mm. issue instructions to the central bank. Mm-hmm. Okay, And uh, on the other side of it is that the state set up a special company to progress the Sandals proposal. And it is that company into which the property has been transferred. So there's, there's a point of view in which one could say, there's a point of view in which one could look at it as being a degree of self-dealing, as something resembling conflict of interest. Mm. So, the, so the first part of it is something that could have some justification. It could be arguable. The second part of it, however, because the two parts have to go together to make sense of it, the second part of it, however, has to do with the price at which the property was transferred. Mm-hmm. And there's a, there's a test. And the test is, mm-hmm. how did you establish the value at which the property was transferred? Mm. And if, in fact, you had two independent valuations and the two valuations are fitting within the range of reasonable opinions that are supported by the evidence in the market in mm-hmm. Tobago, then, then one has made a decision to transfer the property partially in settlement of a debt because the state advanced debt, partially in settlement of a debt on, on, on a basis that is conforming to the law and conforming to good professional practice, Okay. So the notion that everything needs to be advertised in the papers and if it wasn't advertised in the papers, it wasn't sold properly and so on. Those notions don't really have much ground <laughs> in, 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 in the professional life. A lot of times people sell things and particularly large scale things and it's never in the papers and it's not because they're doing something illicit or something funny. Once you get a certain scale of a deal, they're really only in a country the size of Trinidad and Tobago or region like the Caribbean, they really only sometimes could be half a dozen people who could do the deal. Once you've engaged those half a dozen people, you don't need to have an advertisement in the Express or the Guardian. Mm-hmm. That, doesn't, that doesn't add anything, apart from a perception question. And as I said, it, it really is up to the other folks. If, if you wish to continue, and maybe you do, if you, because this is, a, this is a very much a hurly-burly, cut and thrust kind of thing, if you wish to continue with the allegations, and I'm not here to defend Minister Imba, but they are capable of defending mm-hmm. themselves and mm-hmm. so on. I'm very critical on other points. But if you mm-hmm. wish to continue with these allegations about the valuation being an undervalue and so on and so on, produce the valuation for 867 million. Produce it. Let's have a look at it. Let's see who signed it. Let's see what firm it was. What evidence did they use? Mm-hmm. Because I know if I was using any evidence, I have in my office, which is current evidence, mm. my valuation wouldn't be above 200 million. So I leave it there for now. Over to you. <laughs> the other side. Apra Raymond, Thank advocate, uh, surveyor, mm-hmm. and, 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 and he is, he is a person who is not just the advocate. He has spent his money, and he spent his money getting uh, some information, mm-hmm. and the court agreed with him. It's your information. He did not see that information, as a matter of fact, when he said just now he has other issues with the Minister of Finance. Mm-hmm. That's one of them, yes. because your issues with the corporation soul, the right to um, which you went to court, you won. Recent discoveries of irregularities by the finance minister would have been found out. Were we able or were you able to see the documents that the court said you were entitled to? Yes. It raises a question to me, however. Mm-hmm. Now that I hear the minister speaking... I am wondering, could it be that the present government were following through with their investigation and did not want to tip their hand, and that is the reason they did not want you prying into those papers uh, initially? I, I am wondering, because I, I, I looked at it, I know that you said you had a good conversation one time you appeared with us with the Minister of Finance, that's when the government just came to power, and then for some reason that seemed to have fizzled out. Yeah. You came back and you said, <laughs> I ain't too sure right now, Bishop. So, so, so the question is, could they have been, in fact, building what they were building as far as the audit and the investigation, and that's why they did not want to have this information outside? Well, we don't know. I mean, at the end of the day, we don't know, and this is what is injurious about this, because at the, at the end of the day, Renny, that's our information, mm-hmm. and uh, and what is happening is that what is happening is that we have 
we have a narrative developing here. We need to be very robust with the narrative. Mm-hmm. So a narrative has now emerged over the last two Thursdays. Thursday, three days ago, on the on the third of August, mm-hmm. Finance Minister Imbert spoke at length. I think it was almost for an hour. And I looked at it, it was a good statement and so mm-hmm. a lot of information. And one of the points Minister Imbert made echoed and reinforced the points Dr. Rowley, who is the Prime Minister, yes. made the Thursday before the yes. 27th of, of um, July. Mm. And that was also a little bit of an echo. 27th of July was the anniversary of the coup, and it was the 27th anniversary of the coup. And Dr. Rowley was, in fact, making the point about how the group under state control had effectively been mismanaged, had not reported certain things properly, and so on and so on. Minister him, but continued in that theme. And I want to say that... Mm. What, what, what I have experienced in this campaign of mine certainly bears that out. What I want to say is that if that is the case, mm. if what we are being told by two of the most senior officers of the current government is that the directors of CL Financial over the last eight years have successively mismanaged mm-hmm. and improperly reported on what's happened in the company and carried out improper actions, mm. what I expect to see next is prosecutions of those people. I in, I expect to see them brought up on lawsuits under Section 99, Subsection 1 of the Companies Act, which requires them to perform their duty as company directors to particular standards. If they have not mm. performed those duties to those standards, and the minister is in possession of proof, and the prime minister is in possession of proof, and mm. the AG mm. is in possession of, possession of proof, I expect those people, all of them, state appointed mm. and mm. Mr. Dupree appointed, mm. to be the subject of lawsuits, because it's Either or either. Either these are serious allegations grounded in evidence, in which case we need to move ahead and flush out the bandits from the system. If they are just more political, hurly-burly, well, then we need to get a lot less of that. So we re- I'm really saying to you, Renny, it could be that they were investigating this, that, or the other, and they didn't want to let me see this stuff. That could be, I don't know. Mm. But I'm saying that if indeed... I place reliance on Dr. Rowley's statements of the 27th of July and Mr. Imbert's statements yes. of the 3rd of August. Mm. The next thing I expect to see is some sort of serious lawsuits against those company directors of CL Financial for a breach of their duties as company directors so under the Companies Act. Is either we are yes. serious or we are not serious. Mm. So we cannot be talking bad about the previous leadership of CL Financial before the collapse and any leadership post-collapse has not performed properly, and we're giving them a bligh too. We gave the previous leadership a bligh because the nobody's been prosecuted. Yes. Nobody's been found not to be fit and proper. Mm. Mm. Is it bligh season? Are we giving this next group of people mm. a bligh? We need at some point to set a standard, and and I am calling on this occasion. I'm, I'm glad for the opportunity to appear on your show. I'm calling on this occasion. If those are serious allegations grounded mm. in evidence, mm. let there be lawsuits. Let the chips fall where they may. I, I'm pretty. I'm, I'm. I'm pretty optimistic. I'm hoping that that is is what happens. But mm-hmm. it, there's also a point to be made. Sure. Um, because the government uh, appointed uh, directors on this board. I mean, since uh, the control was taken over, and, and and the point was raised in the last five years. Mm-hmm. Uh, what sort of monitoring went on there? So when you say that action has to be taken about a, 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 against a number of people, mm-hmm. it is going to be also that those who, on behalf of the taxpayers of Trinidad and Tobago, uh, appointed directors on on the board who were monitoring the last government, there are some questions to be, to, to be answered too. Yes, that's my point. Absolutely. That, that, that there's mm. a there's a onus of responsibility mm-hmm. on those people to whom we placed those high offices. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I, I know that's where you were going. I just thought I would reiterate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. <laughs> Even without financial statements, I am wondering, mm-hmm. Afra Raymond is my guest. Even without financial mm-hmm. statements, how is it possible mm-hmm. that this much money could have been moved to Scotland and nobody knew. How could that be possible? That's a lot of money. Well, I mean, the, the, the implicit allegation, I, I don't, I mean, again, we, we need a lot more details to understand what happened, but the implicit allegation, it appears to me, from my, from my knowledge of these things, it appears to me mm-hmm. that there's an implicit allegation against the chairman of CL Financial, and that's a very serious thing indeed. That's Dr. Balgobin. Mm-hmm. Because, in fact, as far as I'm aware, Dr. Balgobin is also chairman of Angostura. And Angostura would have had to, <laughs> would have had to authorize the dividend. Yes. So I'll leave it there for now. It's, 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 it's a very serious <laughs> allegation that's been raised in, in the highest quarters in relation to that $1.1 billion of, of, of dividends that was 
reportedly diverted. Diverted, yes. Okay, that, that's a very serious mm-hmm. thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that we have a very serious gap in terms of accountability. Let me mm-hmm. share a, a fresh point with you, Rennie, that we haven't ventilated much in the public. That, that I'm glad again for the opportunity on your popular program to make this point. Mm-hmm. The central bank is required under the Central Bank Amendment Act of 2011, Section 5, um, subsection 7, to make quarterly reports on the progress of the bailout to mm. the High Court. Mm-hmm. We wrote to the Central Bank on the 31st of January, and we being myself, David Walker, and the CEO of Disclosure Today, Rishi Maharaj, we wrote to the Central Bank Governor, Dr. Mm-hmm. Alvin mm-hmm. Hillier, and we put certain questions to Dr. Hillier. Mm-hmm. And uh, they wrote back to us on the 21st of April. They didn't reply to our questions. Otherwise, other than to say, listen, we can't mm-hmm. answer your questions. These things are confidential under the Central Bank Act. And the final sentence of that letter is very interesting. The final sentence of the letter, they say, that kindly note that we are required to file quarterly reports to the High Court and the Parliament in relation to the bailout. Mm-hmm. And we have been complying with that, full stop. You're sincerely blah, blah, blah. Now, that requirement, that statutory requirement to file quarterly reports arose in January 2012. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about it. There's 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016. Mm-hmm. And now we are into the second quarter of 2017. So we're talking about 22 we're talking about 22 quarters that ought to have been filed. Now, I have seen written correspondence from the Parliament that only seven of those have been filed. <laughs> so my point is fortified. Every mm. single mechanism, every single usual mechanism for transparency and accountability and good governance mm. that exists in this country has been disconnected, mm-hmm. discontinued, Disrespected, where the CL financial bailout is concerned, and the population needs to be alert. This is the largest amount of public money we have ever right. spent on anything in the history mm-hmm. of the Caribbean. A country this small spent four billion US dollars. Where did that money go? The we have a big mystery with the money, and even the very central bank has not been satisfying its own statutory requirement that was explained in their own letter of the 21st of April this year. So we have a very serious matter that we have to resolve and we can resolve it by more information, a better quality of information about what has happened in our country with this huge episode. We must get that information in detail. I think the importance uh, of of addressing this situation was clearly um, has not escaped the, the, the leadership of the country, which is the Prime Minister, yes. not the Finance Minister, yes. and we look to see this. There's another area here, mm-hmm. Afra, that I, I cannot have go. Afra Raymond is the voice that you're hearing this morning. Yes. He, uh, uh, he has been on this from day one. And uh, Afra, the transfer of shares, I believe, must surely go through some regulatory body. Yes. Yes. How was Mr. Dupre able to transfer $10 billion worth of stock to Dalco Capital Management and its director, Carlton Reese, uh, for just $99? I mean, well, I mean, it, what? what how, how is that done? Well, I mean, um, I had a session with some friends the other night talking about this, and uh, we were actually making a point that it's very interesting that on the one hand, we have a narrative which Minister D- Minister um, uh, Imbert and he made a Freudian slip and said, Minister Dupree, and I really care for that stuff. <laughs> be, be real careful. <laughs> be real careful. Yeah. We had a, we had a situation uh, three nights ago where Minister Imbert was explaining to us about the, I think it was 26 or 27% of CL Financial is owned by, by Dalco. And uh, the estimated value of that is $10 billion. And the stamp duty that ought to have been paid on a $10 billion transfer of shares mm was 50 million mm. <laughs> and uh, 50 million was the stamp duty that ought to have been paid but it was transferred for 99 dollars right. and minister Imbert was 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 expressing his 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 disapproval of that and it was an attempt to evade stamp duty and so on and he would have an investigation done and so on and yeah so minister on. said it should have been 500 million dollars in stamp duty no, 50 50 uh, it was 50 okay 50, it should have been 50 yeah, million yeah, yeah, okay yeah. Mm-hmm. but the, but the real point is this for me i mean <laughs> It seems to me there's a fundamental contradiction because the state has a winding up action against CL Financial that is being pursued in the courts of this country 
by senior counsel, Mrs. Deborah Peake. And the meaning of the winding up action, to put it simply, is that the company is bust and they mm. can't pay their debts. So the company is either worth zero or less than zero. So how could 27% oh. of something that's less than zero be 10 billion? Now, I mean, when I was in school, we started new maths. <laughs> but this is new, new maths. Mm -hmm. Because you can't have it both ways. You can't have something that's worth zero and 27% of it is worth 10 billion. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't work that way. And this is one of the ways that the thing is getting out of control. If, this, if the transfer of shares took place, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm advised that it has taken place. If the transfer of shares took place, that means that the Board of Inland Revenue approved the transfer for well, $99. That's, 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 that is what and if I'm the Board of Inland Revenue approved the transfer for $99, and it, it really is not worth $99, then it, then it really is the Board of Inland Revenue that one would have to be probing. <laughs> so I am not at all persuaded by that by that $99 fifty, and I'm not trying to, to to anoint Mr. Dupree or exonerate him. I'm very critical of the of the of the guy, but I'm just making the point that we have to really stick with some solid stuff here. You're and, saying and that you're not buying what the finance minister no, said? No, no, I'm not buying that one. No, no, I support him on the no one's land, but not that one. No, he on his own with that one, but he okay. he can battle on his own. Oh, oh, yes, he can. Yes, he can. <laughs> uh, Afro Raymond, mm -hmm. uh, no man's land settled. Um, sure. it, it, as far as we see here from your mm -hmm. your company's valuation, from two evaluations that the minister referred to, this was a, a, a proper purchase. Yeah. Uh, the Seems overvalue, so, yeah. you are calling yeah. on the folks to prove that their five times over mm -hmm. is, in fact, based on something that's what you're waiting for. Mm -hmm. You're uncomfortable with the with the transfer of the $10 billion. You say you're not buying that. You're waiting for no. something. No, no. And, and, and interestingly, the other area you raised here this morning is if, in fact, that transfer did go through, somebody at the IRS have some answers in that revenue. It sorry, could be, it could be that 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 May that that, 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 that department has to be probed. But the information is that the sale, the transfer of shares, has taken place for ninety nine dollars. I did not have you here um, post the decision of the appeal courts to go ahead with the provisional liquidators. Mm -hmm. You are in concurrence with that. You think that is yeah. a good move? Yeah, I think I think it I think it seems it seems to resemble a mm -hmm. it seems to resemble Rennie, uh, a bargaining tactic to bring the other side to the table. Yes, and uh, one hopes that there would be some genuine attempt on both sides to resolve this without a long running and bitter litigation. Well, one it hopes, seems as though after the shots were like fired, yeah. there is a willingness of some folks mm -hmm. to come to the table. Yeah, I hear conversation that starts uh, uh, going around. Uh, maybe we should sit down and talk about this again. Yeah, that that is it. I mean, the one the one other point I would I would put the, the two other points I would put forward at this stage in terms of matters to be considered at the negotiating mm -hmm. table mm -hmm. are. And I think I gave, a I gave a list of four points when I spoke the last time. The first point is that we must have interest included in the discussion. You see, we have a situation where in 2008 and 2009, according to the central bank statistics, the average cost of a commercial loan in this country was over 11%. So that interest on that money should have been at least 11%. And by international loans, probably several times that. We've had silence from our economic and our financial commentators and experts about this. What is it that they think? Do they think that the interest rate should have been zero? I regard it as being an abandonment of the public interest. At a critical moment, the public interest would have required proper interest payments oh, yes. for our monies that we were advancing to the wealthiest no, no, Let me, let me hold Caribbean. you back there for sure, just one sure, moment, sure. Afro, because yeah. I remember when I had Permel on, mm -hmm. um, the chairman of the policy holders yes, group, yes. there's question as to whether he's still a policy holder or not. Mm -hmm. The Minister of Finance said he closed it off in 212. In the statement coming from Mr. Permel yesterday, he said, I am a policy holder. So okay. we, <laughs> but in the statement coming from him, <laughs> however, is the fact that his group always wanted to have conversation. Coming out of him is that the plan that's put together by Price Waterhouse is a good one for the taxpayer. Mm -hmm. He is saying that uh, they are willing to talk, they have been willing to talk. If that was the case, how did we get here? Well, I think the missing ingredient, which is why Mr. Imbert's conversation on the 3rd of August was a very important one. I think the missing ingredient is the question of what are the terms of the proposal put forward by the CLF shareholders contained in that Pricewaterhouse plan. Mm -hmm. And un until and unless we know that, 
we wouldn't really understand what is the reason the negotiations appear to have stalled or broken down. Now, from what Mr. Imbert said, the, the Pricewaterhouse document was a draft upon which no reliance could be placed. Mm. And uh, in addition, the essence of the plan, and I understand this from all I've read about it, the essence of the plan was give us back our companies. We will give you a certain amount of cash. And over a period of time, we will pay you back the money. So we are talking about an, a, 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 an essential ingredient that is largely missing from all of this, which is trust. Abusive because relationship. I beat you once. Go ahead. Let's go to counseling. Move back in with me in the meantime while I change. Yeah. There's and, something wrong with it. And I, I have a problem. I don't have much trust in this situation from either side. Yeah? I, think, I think right around the table, the public interest side. has been abused. I don't have oh, much okay. trust. So the interest question is really important. The other question is the fit and proper question. We need to have the persons who got the company into this position in the first place. They need to form no further part going forward. That needs to be clear. The third thing is, mm. of course, the question of accounts because we cannot place the public interest at the back of the queue. This money that bail out Mr. Dupree's companies that are called collectively CL Financial and so on, this money, this $27 billion or $23 billion, however you count it, this money is our money. This is taxpayers' money. Yes. This is money that belongs to the next generation down the road. Mm. This is money that belongs to our children and our grandchildren. We need to have a detailed account, which is what I sued for, a detailed audited account of what was our money used mm -hmm. for, who got our money, the names of the people who got the money. Yeah. And the fourth thing, which has been off the table largely, I've been, I've been pushing it recently, I've written about it in the past, I was pushing it recently. The fourth thing is really the CARICOM dimension. Because one of the things right. that, pardon me, one of the things mm. that the shareholders and their supporters have raised recently is a, a dimension of race politics. So there's been a discussion that this is a black company and the company is coming under pressure mm. from a black government mm. and et cetera, et cetera. And I want to say that a company that was, that was cognizant of its duties and responsibilities as a quotation marks black company would actually have a position on the money raised from CARICOM neighbors, CARICOM brothers and sisters, CARICOM investors and depositors, mm -hmm. all the way from Grenada, St. Kitts, St. Lucia, Barbados, Guyana. Mm. Those people in Antigua, those people put a lot of their money in, and we haven't heard anything coming from the, from the Dupree side, the shareholder side, in terms of how those claimants are going to be treated. Are we going to have them repaid as well? And, and, and speaking as a black company, what is your position in relation to our Caribbean brothers and sisters? Do you have a position? Is it that you have no position? What is your position? We are in emancipation season. We are in the season of reflection. What is your position on the CARICOM indebtedness? and responsibilities incurred by the collapse of CL Financial. A lot of questions and outstanding. Those out are there. my four points. I, I, I got the points. All of them good. Second one, very important. Mm -hmm. uh, you want me to go back and put you in business? No. And, uh, <laughs> and the CARICOM countries are, in fact, raring their heads and asking questions. Mm -hmm. Afro Raymond, my brother, thank you so much. Thank as you. always. Thank you so much for taking the time to and come in this morning. You can see the work at AfroRaymond.net. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rennie. Go again, AfroRaymond.net. AfroRaymond.net. Thank, thank you, Afro. Thank you so much.